I'm just going to speak from the heart. <laughs> um, good evening. It's good to be back here. My very first presentation on vegan nutrition was right here, um, September of 2016. And um, that was the very first time I kind of dealt with my fear of public speaking. Um, and now I'm back here because um, I'm really passionate about this. And I really want to share with you guys the research about health and wellness. And I really want to inspire you to live a happier, healthier, and more vibrant life. So let's get started. All right. So, Christine, how do I go to the next? Do I just go this? Oh, here we go, right? There we go, all right. So just a little bit of background. Um, those of you who saw my first talk got to see this, but the way I became a vegan is the end of 2012, the universe just kept sending me vegan and plant-based patients. Um, and they educated me about the environmental aspects, the health benefits, and also the ethical aspects and animal rights. So that forced me to do my own research and go online, and there was mounds of evidence. Hi, Gia, we saved you some seats here. You can come up here. Um, yeah, so end of 2012, I kept getting vegan patients. I just started, so. So January of 2013, my husband and I said, okay, let's, let's try this vegan thing, and in May, I was gonna turn 40. So we said, okay, maybe we'll transition, and by May, we could be vegans. Well, things were going so well in January, and we were finding out more and more information and reading more and more that both of us decided we didn't wanna wait till May. And February 1st, 2013, became our official um, vegan anniversary. Aww. So the first two years, I was pretty much a closet vegan didn't really change my practice, kept prescribing pills like I had been taught to do in medical school, pills and procedures, that's what we're taught. Um, didn't really talk to my patients about their diet. Um, until 2015, so two years have gone by, I've just done nothing. Um, 2015, I come across Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, PCRM, and I realize there are doctors out there who are eating the way I'm eating, but they're also promoting this diet to their patients. And they're getting tremendous benefits in their patients' health. Um, they're re reversing certain chronic diseases. Um, so I go on their website and I do several nutrition CMEs and start learning this information. And then, February of 2016, I meet Dr. Neil Barnard, the president and founder of PCRM. And he pretty much tells me, I need to do more. I need to be a plant-based doctor. Oh. And also February of 2016, I meet Kristen, the president and founder of Vegan Society of Peace. And she tells me, I need to do a talk. And I need to start educating the community as well. So to prepare for that talk, I go and learn some more um, because I'm afraid to speak unless I really know what I'm gonna talk about. Um, so now I'm officially a plant-based doctor and this is the sign that hangs in my clinic. Let food be thy medicine and, my, and medicine be thy food. And it's a quote by Hippocrates, Beautiful. the father of Western medicine. Um, we all take the Hippocratic Oath um, at graduation from medical school to first do no harm. Um, and I now realize part of that first do no harm is really tell my patients the information that's out there. Um, at this point, I feel like if I don't share it with them, it's almost neglect. Um, so yeah, a lot of them still prefer to pick cholesterol medication despite its side effects. Um, instead of changing their lifestyle. And that's okay, but I at least need to tell them. 
which is something that I hadn't been taught to do in medical school. So now let's dive in. That was the background. Blue zones. Who here already knows about blue zones? Yeah, a lot of you. Okay, so one of you tell us what, what you know about blue zones. Yeah, Christy. Absolutely, that's the, that's the word, active old age. That's, that's perfectly um, what it is. It's not only that they have a lot of centenarians, people who live over 100, but these centenarians don't have dementia. They are not bed bound. A lot of them are not even using a cane or a walker. They're still biking around doing their activities of daily living, still very engaged in their societies. Um, and so these are the five blue zones. Okinawa, Japan, Ikaria, Greece, Sardinia, Italy, Nicoya, Costa Rica, and Loma Linda, California. So we, we have one right here in USA, and we're actually gonna come back to that one specifically. Um, all right, so let me tell you the story of blue zones. Let's go back to 2003. That's when Dan Butner, he was a National Geographic fellow, had done several expeditions for them. He goes up to National Geographic and says, listen, I want to go to the longevity hotspots. I want to lead expeditions there. And fortunately, he gets funding from National Geographic. He also gets funding from National Institute of Aging in Washington, D.C. And he gets his team together. He gets anthropologists, dietitians, geneticists, historians, and, and they go to these blue zones. They live with these people and they try to find out what the habits of these people are that causes them to live long and causes them to live healthy. Because these blue zones, they have one-fifth the cancer rate that we do. They have one-fifth heart disease rate that we do. Um, so what are they doing? What does he find? A quote by him is, a long healthy life is no accident. It begins with good genes, but it also depends on good habits. Well, it turns out he finds that habits are more important than genes. Mm -hmm. They make a bigger difference mm -hmm. than genes. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting the timing of this because this is around the same time that the Human Genome Project was completed in 2003. And after the Human Genome Project was completed, we realized that we actually don't have very many genes. It's only 100,000 genes, which is only five times more than E. coli and just a little bit more than earthworm. Um, but what's complex about us is this thing called epigenetics. So this field of epigenetics was coming out that was showing that gene regulation depends on our lifestyle choices. So we can actually turn genes on and off wow. depending on our lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And so here's a picture of Dan Butner with a centenarian. She is over 100 years old. Wow. And as you can tell, she's very much physically and mentally um, fit and engaged in life still. All right, so one of the main things epigenetics found and one of the main things Dan Butner found was nutrition was a big part. That was a big lifestyle thing that affected these blue zones. So all five of these blue zones, though they are very different cultures, very different geographically, what they had certain things that were in common. And one of those things was that they mainly ate plant-based diets. Mm -hmm. you now they may not know the term vegan or vegetarian, but just traditionally what they ate was mainly plant-based. So 21 meals a week is most, what most of us eat. Seven meal, seven, three meals, seven days a week. About 17 to 18 of their 
21 meals a week are plant-based. It's a large part of their diet. And this Okinawa diet, as you can see, 70% sweet potatoes. Wow. And that's not the case in, of course, every blue zone. There are some blue zones like Costa Rica where rice and beans is a big part of the diet. But no matter what it is, it turns out that about 85% carbs is, is what's going on in a lot of these cultures. Mm -hmm. And I really want to emphasize the importance of that because there is such a fear of carbs in our culture where people are really going on these low carb high fat diets and they are not good for our health and i totally get it bad carbs are horrible um, and they're not eating any ba bad carbs nobody in blue zones is eating cakes or pies or donuts um, or potato chips or french fries. Those carbs are very different than the carbs that nature makes with the fiber intact. If you're eating carbs with the fiber intact, the way it comes in nature, those carbs are really good for you. And actually, um, health professionals follow-up study um, showed that people who are on a low-carb diet have 37% increased risk of getting diabetes. So really, really important to eat your healthy carbs. So in 2006, his book comes out, um, Blue Zones, Lessons for Living Longer from the People Who Have Lived the Longest. Um, and actually I got, you can get this like used for $3 or so if you are curious and wanna read. And even the old 2000, um, Five, I believe, um, edition of National Geographic is still on Amazon, but it's like super expensive. It's like 20 something dollars. I wouldn't spend the money on that. Um, so let's go back to some of the lessons. And when you go online um, on the Blue Zones website, you can actually go to each of the five places um, and you can learn specifically about them. And most of the information will tell you nine big things um, that they have in common. But really, those nine things can then be part of these four things. These four things, and this is Dan Buettner's slide, so um, this is what, what he um, presented. Blue Zones Life Lessons. So let's look at these four. Move naturally. Um, all of these cultures, they have a lot of movement in their everyday anyways. They're not making time to exercise, but they're just moving around a lot, which can be hard in our culture, in our society, with our jobs. So in our case, we do need to exercise. Um, and lifestyle medicine says about 150 minutes a week for maintenance of our health. That's not if you're trying to lose weight or improve your health, then it needs to be more. Uh, about 300 minutes a week or up to 420 minutes a week, which is about an hour a day um, if you're trying to reverse diseases or really improve your health. After 420 minutes, it just really plateaus off and, and the benefits are go up minimally. Um, the other thing on here is right tribe. So these societies, they have this community um, to where one, people around them are healthy, and two, people around them are supportive. So, and there have been studies that show that if your friend becomes obese, it increases your chances of becoming obese, and if your friend's friend becomes obese, it increases your chances by 30%, and if your friend's friend's friend, even third um, degree, it increases your chances by 10%. So if people around us are eating healthy, we tend to eat healthy. People around us are eating unhealthy, we tend to eat unhealthy. So really kind of important to um, nurture your friendships and try to hang out with healthy, happy people. Um, try to come to the potluck and, and be part of, of this tribe or other healthy tribes. Right outlook. Um, so that purpose in life, there's words that um, Dan Buettner calls that uh, like in Japan, they have a word for what that means, purpose in life, and I can't remember it. It, was, it would have been on my presenter notes. I would have done a better job if I could get to it. Um, also, taking time out. Um, observing Sabbath is big in many of those cultures. It's just 
taking a break um, is really important. And eat wisely, as you know, that needs to be a predominantly whole food, plant-based diet as much as possible. Okay, so now let's move on to our own blue zone here in the US, Loma Linda, California. Only an hour away from LA, but people here live 10 to 12 years longer than rest of Americans. So what's going on here? Who can, who can give us a guess on why Loma Linda? Yeah. Absolutely. Seventh-day Adventists live in Loma Linda, California. And why are they healthier? Do you know that as well? Because I know they do eat some meat, but no red meat. Okay, yeah. So basically, um, they are a form of Methodist, but they truly believe that our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. So they treat it as something sacred. And that means they don't drink, they don't smoke, they eat little or no meat, they exercise regularly, and they follow Sabbath. So those are the main things. And this picture here is from the Blue Zones website and is showing a family hiking after church services, um, which is a very common thing. A weekly hike is a part of um, many of these people's um, routine. And then community, again, is very important there as well. So let's look at some Adventist health studies that have been done. So this is to show you that these studies are big. Lots of participants. Adventist Health Study 1 had 34,000 participants and Adventist Health Study 2 is still ongoing um, with so far 96,000 participants. Yeah. Um, and they're over long term. They're not short studies. Um, Adventist Health Study 1 started in 1973 well before Loma Linda was even declared a blue zone. People already knew there was something going on here that we needed to study. And um, the information we've gotten here from Adventist Health Study has been very informative in terms of the data. Um, so let's look at some of that. This is something that we already talked about. So mainly 10 to 12 years longer they live and we, they believe that these four main factors each contribute to three to four years longer each. Not smoking, maintenance of a healthy weight, exercise program, and a vegetarian lifestyle, especially lots of vegetables, fruits, legumes, whole grains, and little or no meat. Okay, so here are some of the data. And this is very interesting, I wanna, um, spend a little time on this slide and the next slide because um, it really shows that even within a blue zone, there is a difference. So the people here are all pretty healthy. They're all pr pretty much exercising. But even within this healthy group, here is what things look like. For body mass index, non-vegetarian, semi-vegetarian, pesco-vegetarian, lacto-ovo-vegetarian, and vegans, for type 2 diabetes prevalence, same kind of graph. So, and then let's look at this next slide with high blood pressure. So here we go, vegetarian, semi-vegetarian, non-vegetarian in terms of hypertension incidence. But this is what I want you to pay attention to. The vegetarian is being described as meat less than once a week, Semi-vegetarian is meat one to two times a week, and non-vegetarian is meat three plus times a week. So even the non-vegetarians in this population are not eating that much meat, right? For a standard American diet, it's three times a day, not three times a week. Yeah. But this is the thing, even with such little difference, there is a big difference. Right? Yes. So even within blue zones, which a lot of people will say, well, blue zones, they do eat some meat. Yeah, but it's the ones who are not eating meat in blue zones who are even healthier. Mm -hmm. And that's what the Adventist health studies really help us see, that even within a similar population that is having similar lifestyle otherwise, in terms of exercise and community, 
just diet variable being different makes a difference. Mm -hmm. So besides physical health, um, Adventist health studies have shown mental health changes as well, delayed onset of dementia and vegetarians, definitely a link between eating meat and dementia. There's also shown to be a link between dairy and Parkinson's disease. Um, so this is how we should be eating, right? We know that from Blue Zones. We know that from Adventist Health Studies. We know that from many other studies by Caldwell Esselstyn, by Neil Barnard, um, the research done by T. Colin Campbell, by Dean Ornish. There is plenty of evidence out there that this is how we need to eat for optimal health and wellness. So lots of fruits and vegetables. Lots of whole grains, not processed, refined grains. Legumes, leafy green vegetables, and then, you know, some high fat whole foods too. Those olives, those avocados, those um, dates. We, we treat ourselves. <laughs> so um, this is what the food pyramid should look like. But how are we eating? We're eating like this. The standard American diet or the SAD diet. Very sad. 63% of our calories are from processed foods, mm -hmm. added fats, oils, sugars, refined grains. 25% mm -hmm. of our calories are coming from animal foods, mm -hmm. and 12% of our calories are coming from plant foods. It's like, the, it's like we're trying to do the anti-blue zone diet. Right. We're right. like trying to see what would be the worst possible diet, and we've come up with it. Mm -hmm. So what we really need to do is try to increase this green part of the pie to 90 to 95% of our calories. That's right. And take away the red altogether. That's right. And decrease this part of processed foods to 5 to 10% of our calories. And that, that is what a whole food plant-based diet is. And that's what in many trials has shown to really reverse diseases and reverse inflammation um, and improve our health. So here is another reminder of what we should be eating. If you guys don't know Michael Greger, look him up. Um, How Not to Die is a great book. His website, nutritionfacts.org, is amazing. Um, so he wants us to eat beans and berries, other fruits, cruciferous vegetables, greens, other vegetables, flax seeds, nuts, spices, whole grains, beverages. And for beverages, he pretty much likes water, hibiscus tea, and green tea, and exercise. And he actually has an app where you can check off every time you eat that, eat that thing, so it keeps, make sure that you get the daily dozen. Oh, and then I wanted to quiz you guys on this. Another one that really reminds me to try to eat the right foods most days is uh, Joel Furman's G-bombs. Who here knows what the G-bombs are? Yeah, Kim. Let's see. Greens. Uh-huh, berries. Beans is the second B, yeah. Yeah, that's the M. Greens. Greens. Greens is the G. Green. <laughs> what is the O and the S? Oh, it's onions. Onions? Seeds. Seeds. Yeah, you guys got it. The G bombs. Greens, beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, and seeds. So try to get that as much as possible in your diet. Onions. And then I'd love to show this slide because it's really. One of the things you see in blue zones is that people are not overweight, they're not obese. They pretty much keep the same adult weight throughout their life. Wow. We think it's normal to keep gaining weight every year. Yeah. We think it's normal for women to gain weight after pregnancies every time. Mm -hmm. But in blue zones, whatever weight they are in their 20s, they're that way in their 30s, in their 40s, in their 50s, in their 60s. Um, and it's really no surprise, because if you're re eating the right foods, then you feel satisfied. So if you're eating lots of fruits and veggies and potatoes, rice and beans, um, those stretch receptors 
will get triggered and you won't overeat. Our bodies like to have three to four pounds of food to come through in a day. And if that three to four pounds is this, right, and this, it's not a problem. But if that three to four pounds ends up this, that ends up being a lot of calories. So just to kind of give you an idea, greens are about 100 calories a pound. Other vegetables like squash are like 200 calories a pound. Fruits are three to 400 calories a pound. Starches are 500 calories a pound. Legumes are 600 calories a pound. And for those of you who follow Chef AJ, she likes to say, eat to the left of um, the green light, right? Green line, and the green line is at 600 calories. So everything I've mentioned so far, you can eat as much of that as you want, and there is no way that you would gain weight. And then we move on to meat is 800 to 1200 calories a pound. Sugars are 1500 calories a pound. Processed foods are 2300 calories a pound. Um, nuts and seeds are 2800 calories a pound. And oil is 4000 calories a pound. Wow. So one spoon of oil has more caloric density than one spoon of any other food. So really need to cut down on the oils for the reasons of caloric density and also because it's a highly processed food and also because it really does cause a lot of inflammation, just like animal foods. Okay, so just while we're here, I also will mention Joel Farman's Nutritarian Diet. Nutritarian Diet, he likes to say, is diet that's high in nutrients but not in calories. But unfortunately, the diet that we are eating is high in calories but poor in nutrients. And when we do that, our body actually wants, craves more food because it's hoping the next thing you put in your mouth will have some nutrients. But if you're already eating foods high in nutrients, your appetite automatically goes down and you, you have that sensation of being full and content. So it's another Another thing to remember when you're eating mindfully is, am I eating foods that are high in nutrients or not? So, I've been in internal medicine for 20 years. I've been prescribing a lot of pills and procedures, increasing insulin doses very um, meticulously to keep their hemoglobin A1C normal. Um, and now I realize this whole time, my patients and I, we've been meticulously mopping the floor, but we haven't turned off the faucet. Mm. And that's what lifestyle medicine is trying to do. So there is a new field called American College of Lifestyle Medicine that is treating the cause, that is trying to get to the root of chronic diseases, that is trying to teach us as physicians and our patients how to turn off the faucet. Um, and I have become very passionate about this and though lifestyle medicine has been around for a little while, um, over 10 years I think, it didn't really get much um, exposure or respect for a while, but now it's like taking off. It's, their membership is growing exponentially, and October of 2017 were their inaugural boards, and I found out about it right before, so there wasn't enough time to study, and I decided I was gonna do it next year. So my husband and I actually took the boards in October of 2018, and we passed. Um, and we are, <laughs> so we are now board certified in lifestyle medicine. And this is a little bit of what lifestyle medicine, what I work with patients on. Um, so importance of healthy eating, and you guys will be very happy to know lifestyle medicine absolutely recommends a plant-based diet. Because lifestyle medicine is a very evidence-based field, and plant-based diet is the only thing that is shown to reverse heart disease and many of the chronic diseases. Keto diet and other diets will make you lose weight, but none of those diets have shown to, to reverse um, di diseases like plant-based diet has. Mm -hmm. 
importance of physical activity, and again, I, I already mentioned to you, 150 minutes if you're just trying to maintain your health and weight, and then more if you're trying to improve or reverse things. Um, importance of stress management. Mindfulness activities. Um, yoga, meditation, gardening. Anything that keeps you present in the present moment really lowers those stress hormones. We are in a state of chronic st stress in large part of our day. And it turns out even taking 15 minutes out to just be um, really, really improves our health by decreasing inflammation and stress hormones. Avoidance of tobacco and this slide doesn't say it, but everything else of lifestyle medicine, um, also alcohol. Improving your sleep, we recommend for most people, seven to nine hours a night. I know that's hard for a lot of people too. I see a lot of Rice students back there, and I know it's, it's hard when you're in college. Um, and then forming and maintaining relationships, healthy relationships. That's the right tribe. So really all the Blue Zone stuff is here as well in lifestyle mm -hmm. medicine. Okay. We've got our Eat Wisely, we've got our right tribe, we've got our right outlook, um, and what was the fourth one? Movement. Movement, Yay. there you go. It's, it's, it's all the same research showing the same benefits. So now, since we're so passionate about lifestyle medicine, um, my husband and I have started a blog. Um, it's called MB Plan Physicians, and we post recipes and videos and blogs every two weeks. Um, so if you guys haven't checked it out, checked us out, go ahead and do that. And you can even subscribe. Um, that way, you can just get the videos. We only do it every two weeks, so you won't get it too frequently. We don't have that much time to be sending out things. Oh, but one thing uh, is that if you ever have a question or if you ever want us to do a blog on something, if you ever want to research something for you or a friend or a family member, just let us know. We're happy to do that. Okay, so here are the steps that I recommend. Do not use tobacco in any form. Eat a variety of plant foods. Have a variety of colors within your daily menu. My last presentation went a lot into phytonutrients. I didn't have time for that today, but those different colors will give you a lot of phytonutrients that you need. Consume at least 40 grams of fiber a day. Currently, USDA recommends like 25 to 30, and most Americans are only getting 15. Even the vegans in this country are not getting enough fiber because we're eating a lot of processed foods. So really need to increase that fiber. Avoid animal products and minimize added vegetable oils. Eat real food. Read those ingredients. If it has a lot of chemicals or names you can't pronounce, just put it back. And even real food, not too much. A lot, the, a lot of the blue zones have, um, especially Okinawa, Japan, have this culture of before they sit down to their meal, they say this phrase, again, I can't remember, and it's part of my presentation notes, um, which basically says, Eat only till you're 80% full. Um, minim which today I ate till I was 110% full because <laughs> the food was really delicious, but in general. Um, minimize alcohol intake, engage in regular physical activity, maintain your weight at or near your ideal level. Meditation or other mindfulness activities make them a part of your day, just at least, you know, it's, I know we feel like we don't have enough time, but 24 hours, we can take out five to 10 minutes for a bit of self-care. Uh, sleep seven to eight hours a night. So, it's really not that complicated. It's, there's nothing, no secrets that Blue Zones have. We just need to eat well, move well, and rest well. Mm -hmm. And I, Wish all of you a very happy, healthy, and vibrant 2019. And, and I hope you continue the new habits, um, healthy habits that you form this coming year. Be well, my friends. Thank you. Thank you.